I would like to extend my thanks to uh, Dr. Philip Armstrong and the Comparative Studies Department for the opportunity to speak here today to present a uh, thesis of my paper. Uh, the title of this is, The Bible is Woven Through the Skein of the American Tapestry. I'd like to open with a quote by Isaac Asimov. There is a cult of ignorance in the United States, and there always has been. The strain of anti-intellectualism has been a constant thread winding its way through our political and cultural life, nurtured by the false notion that democracy means that my ignorance is just as good as your knowledge." Unquote. I found this statement inspirational and compelling. It stirred me to my core. The purpose of education is not only the furtherance of knowledge, but also the solution to the epidemic of ignorance. With my mind's eye, by way of books I've read, courses I've taken, people I've been exposed to, I sought to gaze upon the tapestry of our American culture and society, which have been a part, I have been a part of since my birth, seeking some aspect, attribute, defining characteristic to illuminate. I found a thread of commonality, which I would like to share, based upon the erudition of Dr. Leland Riken, the prolific author and professor of English, for 43 years at Wheaton College, who stated, quote, It, the Bible, is the central and foundational book of Western culture, including American culture. Everywhere we turn in the cultural past, we find a Bible. We could not avoid it if we tried, and we will not understand our past without a knowledge of the Bible, unquote. Building upon his assessment, I propose that for someone to fully understand American culture and society, they should not be ignorant, but as Asimov instructs, have knowledge to recognize and distinguish the undeniable influence the Bible has had upon the development of American culture and society. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once proclaimed, nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. I believe by eliminating ignorance, we increase patience and tolerance within our pluralistic and diversely expanding country. I invite you to join with me in pulling at two of the threads of the American tapestry to observe more closely how and why the Bible is interwoven in our culture and society. For I assert that to be ignorant of that influence is to fail to understand America. What I present to you today is part of a much larger analytical research paper that I've done where I answer questions drawn from selected threads of our American tapestry such as the political, the entertainment, in immigration, the civil rights movement, and our, ec ed our economic and educational systems to add to our knowledge and reduce ignorance. Today, due to brevity of time, I will present two of those threads and answer two major questions in direct relation to our American tapestry. Those two questions are, how has the Bible had an impact on American politics? And, how has the Bible influenced the American civil rights movement? I will strive to avoid any denominational bias. I recognize there is a potential to nominate more and different categories and questions requiring a greater expanded scope, research, time, and effort. But what I present today is representative of ways that the Bible is woven throughout the scheme of the American tapestry. As far back as the formation of the 13 original colonies, there have been vociferous opinions concerning the proper situation for religion, religious creeds, and their materials within our country's amalgam of doctrines, assertions, and intentions which promote and justify its behaviors. Arguments over such topics are still being waged today. Amendment 1 of our Constitution states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. This sets the standard of neutrality in our country for the privilege to practice one's religious beliefs, including the abstention from any, while simultaneously enjoying freedom from the potential religious oppression which others might attempt to impose. In the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 24, it reads, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This is part of a much larger conversation between Jesus and an unnamed Samaritan woman on what was the proper way to approach God. This is not so unlike conversations between religious faiths today here in America, which can take place 
because of the balance of religious neutrality. A possible inference from this quote is that just as Abraham, from the book of Genesis, found his relationship with his God in nature under the stars, every person deserves the opportunity and space to find his or her relationship with the Creator. In the last 200 years or so, a large quantity of cases brought before the Supreme Court, both state and federal, have dealt with religion, religious practices, religious beliefs, and their appropriate spaces as they interact with the laws of the land. How people engage with teachings, principles, not only from the Bible, but also Plato, Aristotle, Kant, Locke, Jefferson, and many others, this is what makes up a religion. And the people should take full responsibility for their actions. Whether American society chooses to admit it or not, its fundamental morality comes from the Bible. But this does not make America religious, nor does the influence of tenets from the Bible necessarily bring division or oppression upon other religions and people of other kinds of faiths. The Bible has mutual ties, mutual religious ties and influences shared with the Quran, and together both have their origins in the Tanakh, the canon of the Hebrew Bible, which is commonly known as the Old Testament. Because of this mutual heritage tying the religions of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam back to one common ancestor, they are categorized as Abrahamic religions. These three religions agree in many cases, and where this overlap occurs, they give each other credence. Thus, three of the world's most prominent faiths are interwoven with each other and have direct and indirect influences on one another, and in their midst is the Bible. People will often invoke the name of the Creator and reference the Bible for the use of the authority which both command in the minds and hearts of others. Whether they do so out of honesty or deceitful manipulation is always for the audience to judge. Let's delve deeper to observe how one book, the Bible, has been interwoven into the tapestry of American society and culture. Question number one. How has the Bible had an impact on American politics? Beginning with John Winthrop's speech, <clears throat> We shall be as a city upon a hill, made in 1630. Winthrop derives this quote from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 14, which is an extract from a much larger passage commonly known as Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. When Winthrop originally gave this speech, considering all the aspects covered, it becomes evident he desired to set, to inspire the residents of the Massachusetts colony to be better people, to set a better example, to adhere to better standards for interrelationships with others. In his essay, dealing with how this particular speech has become a continuing thread in American politics. Mark A. Knoll, professor of history at the University of Notre Dame, details how Winthrop was an influential icon for presidents beginning with Washington all the way through till Reagan. According to Winthrop, writes Knoll, the primary reason for this divine stratification was that in their diversity, people might realize they have need of others and from hence they might all knit more nearly together in the bond of brotherly affection. Noel continues, differences of rank were never to be occasions for haughtiness or dejection, but opportunities to promote the glory of God and the good of the creature. Winthrop would continue in his speech to speak of self-sacrifice for the betterment of others, referencing concepts of similarity from biblical texts clearly extolling what he believed were qualities of moral virtue. His authority was not of himself alone, but also from the written text of the Bible. Noel further records, he, Winthrop, was at pains to explain that while God demanded both justice and mercy in all dealings, it was particularly imperative for mercy to prevail in the estate of regeneracy with a difference between Christians and others. Presidents John F. Kennedy and Ronald Reagan were known to have quoted Winthrop and credited <coughs> Winthrop's influence directly in their political speeches, and in doing so, may have sought to evoke similar meaning and heart within their rhetorics. As a counterpoint 
to the seemingly noble and righteous standpoint of Winthrop and others who founded the American colonies, codified our Constitution and Bill of Rights, and set up our government so that any might have free exercise of religion, it should also be taken into account how this same philosophy would be the cause of the persecutions endured by the Native Americans. Winthrop's speeches, where he referenced the Bible time and again, would much later be turned about and morphed into the doctrine known as Manifest Destiny. In 1845, an unsigned article in a popular American journal, a long-standing Jacksonian publication, the Democratic Review, issued an unmistakable call for American expansionism, focusing mainly on bringing the Republic of Texas into the Union. It declared that expansion represented the fulfillment of our manifest destiny to overspread the continent allotted by providence for the free development of our yearly multiplying millions. Thus, a powerful American slogan was born. That slogan was manifest destiny. The doctrine of higher standards and a superior example for the betterment of others in justice and mercy had been transformed into a sword for the slaughter of the people native to the American continent and justification for American imperialism and covetous territorial ambitions. This is a clear example of how people from our past would misappropriate scriptures to suit their own selfish purposes. Perhaps claiming from the Psalms, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. Psalms 2, verse 8. While ignoring rhetoric in the book of Romans, as much as lieth within you, live peaceably with all men. From Romans chapter 12, verse 18. Just as any tool, such as a hammer or axe, can be used for profitable or for malicious purposes, so too the Bible has been used for negative outcomes, which have left scars on American history. Unfortunately, as often as it has been used to promote life and peace. The choice for which will prevail, blessing or cursing, life or death, is always in the hands of the reader. Moses and Jesus stood for life. What will history record that you and I stood for? Question number two. How has the Bible influenced the American Civil Rights Movement? The Civil Rights Movement here in the United States was spearheaded by Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., an American Baptist minister who was a coalescence of the influence and teachings of three great men with the Bible as the unifying center in the character of Dr. King. Those men were Abraham Lincoln, Mohandas K. Gandhi, and Jesus Christ. In his letter from the Birmingham jail, after being labeled a religious extremist by his white oppressors who tried to silence him, Dr. King proclaims, quote, but, I, but though I was initially disappointed at being categorized as an extremist, as I continued to think about the matter, I gradually gained a measure of satisfaction from the label. Was not Jesus an extremist for love? Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Was not Martin Luther an extremist? Here I stand, I cannot do otherwise, so help me God. And Abraham Lincoln, this nation cannot survive half slave and half free. Perhaps the South, the nation, and the world are in dire need of our creative extremists." Unquote. Lincoln's stand against the oppression and enslavement often nets him the credit for the beginnings of what would become the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s. He is quoted as saying, those who deny freedom to others deserve it not for themselves. It is no coincidence that when Dr. King delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech, he did so on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. It is no coincidence the verbiage he used eloquently echoed Lincoln's from the Gettysburg Address, for he was calling out the political forces of America to make good on the duties and promises they had inherited from President Lincoln. Mohandas K. Gandhi is known the world over as possibly the most powerful pacifist protester to have ever lived. 
He is held as responsible for the ousting of the British government from India without ever firing a bullet or raising a hand in anger against another man. Though raised as a Hindu, Gandhi studied the Bible and was enthralled with the character of Jesus and the strength it took for him to live out his teaching of turn the other cheek and not to lash out in violence on another human being. In Gandhi's book, an autobiography, The Story of My Experiments with Truth, he reflects on how Jesus' Sermon on the Mount deeply resonated with him. He said, that renunciation was the highest form of religion. It appealed to me greatly. Gandhi would go on to synthesize Jesus' sayings and teachings into much of his own, which in turn have been replicated on the lips of many others since. When called into question concerning his religious faith, if he was a Hindu, Gandhi's reply was, yes, I am. I am also a Muslim, a Christian, a Buddhist, and a Jew. I love all mankind as I love my own countrymen because God dwells in the heart of every human being, and I aspire to realize the highest in life through the service of humanity. Dr. King drew from Gandhi's effective example of being the living embodiment of Jesus' teachings for the 20th century. In 1959, due to inspiration from Gandhi's example and the effectiveness of Gandhi's practice of Satyagraha, he traveled to India to learn more of Gandhi's methods of protest. Based in part upon biblical teachings such as turn the other cheek, Satyagraha is the discipline of adherence to absolute truth in the confrontation of injustice with nonviolence. Dr. King referred to Mahatma Gandhi as the guiding light of our technique for nonviolent social change. Dr. King believed in the racial and ethical equality of all people. Finally, in his speeches, Dr. King would call on the authority of scriptures quoted from the King James Version of the Bible, not for the representation of any denomination, but for the truth they held which demanded the end of segregation and the equal treatment of men and women, regardless of race, color, or creed. If one were to refer to the passages of Scripture, such as Acts chapter 10, verse 34, Romans chapter 2, verse 11, or James chapter 2, verses 2 through 9, which speak against elitism and extol that God is not a respecter of persons, it is very easy to see the origin of King's belief that an impartial God should be reflected in a Judeo-Christian culture such as the United States, whose motto is, in God we trust. Clearly, it was this belief of impartiality and equality which resonated in King's speech when he proclaimed on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, quote, when we let freedom ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty we are free at last. May we continue to draw from such rich examples so that in the elimination of ignorance, we may live in tolerance, peace, and love for each other, ever striving to lift up those who are suffering, mending those who are broken, and working to bring liberty to those who are unjustly oppressed. Former President Obama, drawing from the book of Exodus, at his second inaugural address stated, quote, Scripture tells us that we are not to oppress a stranger, for we know the heart of a stranger. We are and always will be a nation of immigrants. We were strangers too, unquote. In conclusion, we have pulled on two of the threads from the skein of our American tapestry, those of the political and of the civil rights movement. We have looked over evidence of how the Bible has been woven through the fabric of our culture and society. I leave it to you to answer the following questions. How is it the Bible's influence is so abundant in our country? Whether directly or indirectly, how has the Bible influenced your life? And what will you
you choose to do with the knowledge of that prevailing influence.